Tonight, we have thrips to palm weevils, identifying and managing horticultural pests of San Diego with Dr. Eric Middleton. All right, can you all hear me? Perfect, okay. Um, I have a tendency to sort of turn my head away from microphones, I find out. So if you suddenly stop being able to hear me, just start wildly waving your arms or something. We'll try to get it a little bit closer back to my mouth. So as I said today, we're gonna to be covering a whole lot of different things, trips to palm weevils, talking about both identifying and then ultimately managing a variety of these horticultural pests in San Diego County. I'm an entomologist by training, so we're gonna be talking about insects and strap it because there's going to be a lot of information. So you may want to eventually go back and uh, revisit parts of this because there's a lot of things we're going to be talking about. So I apologize if we move a little bit quickly, uh, but there will be time for questions as well. With that in mind, what we're going to be talking about, an outline today, we first off have a very brief overview of just kind of San Diego agriculture, a lot of the things that grow here and some of the common pests that affect those. And then also a brief overview of what integrated pest management, abbreviated IPM, is all about. After that, we're going to be talking about these four main types of pests, and then we'll finish off with some pests that you want to be on the lookout for, things that aren't necessarily present in San Diego County just yet, um, or their effects are not fully known, but things that you should be aware of, um, and hopefully don't become too much of an issue into the future. So that's what we're going to be talking about. First, though, the main crops of San Diego. Um, I often deal with people who are more sort of in an ag setting, but I'm kind of curious how many of you deal with these different kind of major cropping areas. So we have ornamentals, which make up from the ag perspective, the vast majority of sort of the dollar value that's produced in San Diego. How many of you like work with or would consider yourself definitely, de it, excuse me, definitely involved with ornamentals out in the audience? Couple, some, okay. Um, there's also, of course, citrus. Um, I think lots of us have that in our yards, grow it, lemons, oranges, grapefruits, lime, et cetera. How many of you have citrus? Yeah. Yep, we'll talk about some of the best of those. Avocados, this one actually has the highest acreage in the county, which is decreasing pretty rapidly because they take so much water. A lot of people are starting to swap them out for things like vineyards and uh, other different things like that. How many of you have avocados or work with those? All right, a couple, not quite as many as say citrus. And then one of the other big parts of San Diego County is that we have a whole ton of small farms, the greatest number of small farms per county in the U.S., which is kind of surprising, not necessarily something a lot of people know about. Um, of course, that covers almost everything uh, get put under the umbrella of small farms. How many of you would consider yourself small farm owners or work with people like that? One. That's not bad. <laughs> There's still some. <laughs> So yeah, generally speaking, that kind of covers the main different sort of cropping things of San Diego County. And then it also correlates pretty well with a lot of the things that are grown here. And when it comes to different common arthropod pests for each of those different sections, this also really illustrates uh, what you're probably likely to be running into in all different contexts. So when we're talking about ornamentals, this is an incredibly broad category, um, but there's many different things, thrips, mites, mealybugs, scales, and aphids. Those are oftentimes kind of the usual suspects that you're gonna see popping up on ornamentals of all different kinds, whether that's nursery production or in your own backyard. When we're talking about things like avocados, we have per se a mite, there's a picture of the damage uh, in the upper right of the corner. We also have things like avocado thrips, avocado lace bugs, avocado brown mite. Generally speaking, the arthropod pests of avocados aren't the most severe, but there are a number of them as well. For citrus, there's some really bad ones, things like Asian citrus psyllid in particular, which we'll go into in more detail. There's also many scales, mealybugs, thrips, and then ants, which kind of exacerbate all of those different problems. For small farms, again, huge variety. A small farm is not really a crop. So there's thrips, caterpillars, mealybugs, aphids, but it really depends on the kind of crops you're growing. And then another thing that I think a lot of people often kind of forget about um, when they're thinking of pests, but I'm sure many of you guys think about, is landscapes. Um, all the different trees and other things like that that can be affected by pests. We have palm weevil, we have shockle borers, we have G sob stands for gold spotted oak borer. We're going to be talking mostly about the first one. So, in this list, we're going to be talking a bit more about thrips, Asian citrus psyllid, and palm weevil in particular. Um, but these are the main general kind of pests that you're likely to see overall thrips, mealybugs, scales, aphids. But this does vary highly by crop and by situation. And also, these are oftentimes the ones that are just kind of the usual suspects, but not necessarily the most damaging pests. Many of the most damaging pests that we see, the ones that cause the most harm to your crops or to your plants, are going to be invasive pests. And when it comes to invasive pests in San Diego, we have quite a few. Most of the ones we're going to be talking about today are invasive pests. So San Diego, very susceptible to invasive pests. As I said, many of the worst pests we have here are invasive. 
And there's a number of different kind of reasons and explanations for all of this. Why do we have so many invasive pests? Partially it's because we're right on the border. We have all the different pests that may be in the United States that can come here. And then many of the pests that come from Mexico, Central, South America can also be coming through here. Additionally, we have a major port and we have a very strong agricultural economy and there's lots of imports because of that, both agriculture related and otherwise. That means that lots of things come in. There's a lot of different chances for a variety of pests to be introduced and become established in San Diego. We have a huge diversity of crops, as I'm sure all of you are very aware. Lots and lots of stuff grows here, which is great for us, um, but it also means that there's a lot of different things that pests can become established on. And there's many different growing conditions, lots of different microclimates, which makes it, again, a really great environment for lots of pests to potentially get going. So there we go. Um, the last thing is that we have an overall mild climate, one of the really big selling points of San Diego in general. What that means though is that we don't have harsh winters, we don't have harsh summers, that pests can survive year round and they usually can reproduce year round. So these are all reasons why it is that San Diego has a, large, a large number of invasive pests. The question then is how should we approach managing pests, both invasive and otherwise. And I'm an IPM advisor. I focus on integrated pest management. So I definitely think that's the best way that we should be approaching all these problems. Integrated pest management, abbreviated as IPM. There's a lot of different definitions of it. Again, I'm sure all of you have heard about this before, but the way I like to think about IPM is as knowledge-based pest management. Essentially, you're understanding the pest, you're understanding the system, and you're reacting appropriately because of that. IPM utilizes many different techniques to manage pests, and it specifically tries to avoid the pitfalls of conventional management. Conventional management being where you basically just apply insecticides to manage your pests. There's a whole suite of problems that come alongside that, and integrated pest management seeks to avoid most of those. It considers the economic and human health costs of the management, and of course, it also considers the environmental costs, and it seeks to avoid or mitigate all of these. So there's multiple techniques that can be used in integrated pest management, and they can be thought of as a pyramid because this is still a pretty vague definition. So the best way to understand IPM, I think, is by looking at the IPM pyramid. This is how I learned about integrated pest management. And I think it really illustrates how you should be using different components of it. The different parts of the pyramid, basically the lower down you go, the bigger the size of the blocks. The size is indicative of the amount of effort and time that you should ideally be spending on that different block or uh, activity that's listed there. So let's start on the bottom. Where should you be spending the most time and effort? It's on identification, scouting, and monitoring. Essentially, you need to know what your pests are and when they are present. If you don't know that, you cannot have effective management. You're gonna be wasting your time. You're gonna be wasting your resources and probably uh, have a whole lot of other unintended consequences to that. Beyond identification and scouting and monitoring, you wanna be using things like cultural control, prevention, and sanitation. Basically, all this is preventative measures, making sure the pests don't get established in the first place, and then also some basic but very powerful control options, things that the pests have a very difficult time adapting to. That can be screening in areas where the pests simply can't get in. That can be crushing the pests while you're tilling an area. All this is very difficult for them to adapt to, and that makes these control measures particularly powerful. Next up, we have biological control, which is using beneficial organisms. You can use it both passively and actively. Passively, basically creating a beneficial environment for those organisms to survive. So having areas where more insect predators or parasitoids can persist. Actively, you can go out and buy pathogens or predators, release them as active pest control. And then finally, up at the top, it is important to note that chemical control, pesticides, are a part of integrated pest management as well. And they're especially a part of integrated pest management when it comes to the invasive pests that we're gonna be talking about today, because oftentimes you want something that works particularly well against them. And also these other different uh, control options take a little bit more time to develop if the pest is novel in the area. The last thing in the IPM pyramid that oftentimes is left out, but I think is really important to add in, is sort of an overarching idea that we should shift our perspective a little bit when thinking about pest management. What I mean by that is that you should be able to accept some damage and adjust your expectations a little bit. You shouldn't be able to expect that you know your plants will always look perfect. You'll never find a single aphid or something on them. If that's your expectation going in, it's going to be very, very difficult to manage all of your pests without resorting to chemical control on a consistent basis. So adjusting your expectations um, and sort of accepting some damage as much as you can is quite important to integrated pest management. So. This is the general framework that you should be approaching with when you're managing almost any different kind of pest, including all the different invasive ones that we are going to touch on right now. The first one we're gonna be talking about is the South American palm weevil, abbreviated SAPW. 
For their biology and their identification, a picture of all the different life stages is right here. So Alcorn and Palm Weevil is present in San Diego County and has been since 2011. So it's been actually a little bit so far. And it's problematic throughout mostly the southern part of the county, uh, areas like Bonita, National City, um, Chula Vista, and then up into La Jolla. Palm Weevil is definitely present as attacking a lot of different uh, palm species, excuse me, palm trees uh, present there. It's not really present in North County. Uh, to, uh, so far. But as for identification, you can see them all on the bottom. The adults on the far right are large black beetles, about one to two inches long, with a pretty pronounced snout. And then the larvae, which you're also likely to see if you're actually cutting down trees, are on the left. They're kind of yellowish grubs with very large mandibles, which they use to chew into the growing tissue of palms. Females will lay their eggs in the top of palm trees. The larvae then hatch out the eggs and then begin, begin consuming the growing tissue of the palm. And very large trees can have quite a few larvae, dozens or I've even heard accounts of hundreds of larvae present in a single Canary Island date palm. So you can get quite a few of them up there growing and eating in that uh, growing tissue. Symptoms. What should you be looking for? The picture is going to be a little bit small for you out in the audience in person, but you're looking for things like notched leaves. So at the very top of that palm tree, you can see the section where the leaves kind of are a little bit notched, a little bit asymmetrical. That's from where the leaf weevils have been feeding when the leaf was still growing and then grows out and you have this kind of eaten away section that you can see uh, up at the top of that picture. You can also find spent cocoons, the sort of palm weevil, uh, palm, excuse me, palm fibers that have been spun together by the weevils left on the ground. They kind of look like large cigars. You'll also find occasionally fronds like this one that have fallen to the ground that have holes bored through them from the palm weevil. Those are all the preliminary early signs. That's what you want to be looking out for. You don't want to wait until your tree looks like this, where the crown collapses. Uh, it starts to look like an umbrella or a brown mushroom or something like that. At this point, the tree has sustained significant damage. And in many cases, especially this picture here, is almost certainly dead. So here's another example of a tree that's been attacked very obviously and showing very advanced symptoms in the background. What are the different hosts of South American palm weevil and how do you monitor for them? South American palm weevil primarily attacks Canary Island date palms, but numerous other species can serve as hosts. Canary Island date palms, however, are definitely the preferred hosts. They're what's going to be uh, going to be being attacked most frequently in San Diego County. So if you have a Canary Island date palm and you live especially in South County, you should be aware of this. Um, they almost will always kill trees if left unchecked, and damage can occur very rapidly. In the span of weeks to months, you can go from seeing almost no symptoms to your tree being entirely dead. So you need to be aware of that, be vigilant, monitor closely for symptoms and other signs. As an example, this was a tree that was in an alleyway next to my house. In September 2022, we had the notched leaves. That's basically the only sign of damage. Otherwise, it looks pretty healthy. And then in February 2023, the entire tree is dead. So this can happen quickly uh, um, and you can lose a tree that took quite a long time to grow and there's a kind of a centerpiece of you know, landscaping in your area. So again, vigilance is very important for these. How do you monitor for them? Uh, using traps to monitor populations is a very effective way of seeing if palm weevils are present in your area. Although generally speaking, if you're in a lot of areas in South County, you should just assume that the palm weevils are present. But you can use traps in order to monitor for them. If you are using them, make sure you place those traps in shade, at least 500 yards from palm trees, if possible. The reason you put them in the shade is so if they're in full sun, then the pheromone that you put inside the trap rapidly degrades. Um, if they're in shade, it lasts much longer. And you don't want to put them on your palm trees or near them, because if weevils are attracted to the trap and they miss the trap, they'll then probably go to your palm tree uh, and start infesting that. So there's been numerous cases where I've seen people putting traps literally on trees. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Okay. If you do use traps, you should be using cocoon traps like the one pictured here. They're much more effective, about six times more effective than kind of bucket traps, which were uh, standard a little while ago. So Goosen traps, such as this one, are certainly the ones to be using for South American palm weevil. When it comes to actually managing palm weevil, the options are limited. It does work, um, but they're not the best. So for managing South American palm weevil, the main thing that you're going to be doing is consistently applying prophylactic insecticides over and over again, never stopping, uh, because otherwise your tree will eventually get attacked and die. So... <laughs> It's not a great system. It's not very in line with like what we often think of as integrated pest management, but unfortunately, it's one of the best options we currently have. Applying soil drenches or canopy sprays, or in some cases, uh, trunk injections, but the first two are the ones I've heard of as being a bit more effective. Using systemic insecticides that contain the active ingredients like imidacloprid or dinotefrin. Using those, you can prophylactically protect the tree. Whenever palm weevils arrive and try to lay eggs or feed on it, they will then get poisoned and die. Um, that's basically 
the state of the management when it comes to palm weevils. It's just trying to continually apply insecticides so that they never get established on your tree. If you do end up with a tree uh, that has been badly infested, like the one pictured in the background here, you're going to want to remove it. Um, it's becoming a hazard. It's almost certainly dead at this point. So make sure you work with professional arborists to do this. Don't do it by yourself. That's incredibly dangerous. When you do remove the tree, make sure you chip the remains in order to kill any weevils that are present inside because there are usually quite a few of them that are left inside the top of the crown. Some trees do recover. So it does happen uh, where you can have a situation where your tree starts to really collapse, has pretty severe symptoms, you then treat it with insecticides and some of the growing tissue is left alive and it's able to regrow. So you can see in this picture in the upper right where it kind of looks like you can see where it's been flattened off in the past. And then there's that new growth coming up in the middle. It can happen. You should not rely on it being able to happen. No insecticides are going to be able to fix the damage that weevils have already caused to your tree. Um, so if they have killed the growing portion, the tree is dead and it's not coming back. Only in some situations are you lucky enough that they haven't consumed all of it once you start to get severe symptoms. So yes, some trees will recover, but it is not consistent. And by far, it is best to prevent infestations as opposed to trying to fix them after they've occurred. There's some ongoing research on attract and kill methods, which is basically having pheromones uh, with a bit of insecticide attached to them. The beetles fly in attracted by the pheromone, touch the insecticide, and then die. That's probably one of the most promising immediate short-term solutions. There's also options looking into biocontrol, bringing in dekinid flies like this one, which parasitize the palm weevils. That's certainly going to be farther in the future. That takes a long time to fully implement and actually get going. Um, but as of right now, eradication or full control of these weevils is not feasible currently. It's definitely a pest you're going to have to sort of learn to live with. So with that in mind, I'm not an expert on South American palm weevils, but I am putting together a workshop with a bunch of people who are. If you want to learn more about this, it's taking place on October 12th. Um, here is a QR code that you can scan to get more information about the agenda, or if you want to register for it, it's down in Bonita at a Sweetwater Summit House in the Sweetwater Regional Park. So that's a really good opportunity. If you want to learn more about this, really hear about the sort of the state of the science on palm weevils and go much more in depth with all of this. I think it should be a really interesting uh, program. This will be available at the end too if you want to take a look at that later on. So with that, we're now going to switch to a different pest, uh, one that is also quite damaging but also affects trees but in a rather different way. We're going to be talking now about Asian citrus psyllid and huanglong being the disease that it vectors. So let's start with the psyllid, the insect first. Scientific name is Diaphorina citri. They are sap feeding insects that predominantly target new flush on citrus trees. So the eggs, the nymphs, and the adults, which are all pictured here, will all be based on new flush of citrus trees. Only occasionally will the adults be seen somewhere else. And they feed on all different kinds of citrus, as well as plants like orange jasmine and curry leaf. And on their own, they cause relatively little damage. You can see where they'll cause their feeding will cause these kind of notched leaves or some tip die back. They're really not a very serious problem unless they're in high numbers until we have the disease, which they vector, which comes along, and then they become absolutely devastating in combination. So Wenglong Bing is the disease. It's abbreviated as HLB, and it's also known as citrus greening disease. Um, but the main name that sort of is used in the scientific community is Wenglong Bing, but you've probably heard of it as citrus greening. Wenglong Bing is a bacterium that lives inside the phloem of the trees, and it causes systemic disease, so it affects the tree from the top all the way to the bottom. And it's spread by feeding Asian citrus psyllid. So in the same way that mosquitoes can vector malaria amongst us humans, HTP can vector Wenglong Bing amongst citrus trees. There is no cure for Wenglong Bing. Um, once a tree is infected, and especially as the bacterial titer increases, the tree begins to lose roots. Uh, once it loses significant root mass, you begin to see symptoms throughout the tree itself. It begins to die back. The whole thing starts to look pretty terrible. Um, and then, especially if the bacterial titer gets high enough, the tree is almost certainly going to die. And if it doesn't, it'll be wasting away slowly. So the lifespan is very significantly affected. The fruit becomes quite bitter, uh, like it takes a very odd sort of flavor. It also will stay a little bit more green, hence the name citrus green disease. You can see a picture as an example down in the bottom left. Also, if you cut the fruit open, you can see symptoms like a crooked midrib, sort of the asymmetrical look on the inside of the fruit. And then also looking at the leaves, they'll start to become yellow. It's a little bit different than sort of things like nutrient deficiency because the yellowing of leaves from HLB is more asymmetrical than for nutrient deficiency, which is usually more symmetrical on the leaves. You'll also find that leaves have thicker veins proportionately. All that being said, it's very hard to, uh, it's basically impossible to detect HLB and positively identify it just from symptoms. So if you think your tree is experiencing some of these symptoms, it's best to get a PCR test 
to identify it positively because of that. But the question then is how damaging actually is HLB? And we can look to Florida for some answers because Florida is an area that had a whole lot of citrus growing and HLB is completely widespread. This is where I was previously doing a postdoc. So some of my research is based on this. And I think looking at Florida really gives us an idea of the kind of the damage that HLB and ACP can cause and what could hopefully not happen in California in the future. So looking at citrus production in Florida, here we have acres of citrus in the thousands that was being produced. On the x-axis, we have years. So going forward in time up to about 2022, y-axis is acres of citrus. Here in 2005 is when HLB was first detected in the state. The psyllid was already present in the state before the disease was uh, found. So psyllid's already there, but then in 2005, the disease is found. In 2004, just before it shows up, there's about 750,000 acres of citrus growing, so quite a bit of it. The disease shows up, and then numbers drop and keep dropping over and over again until in 2022, there's about 375,000 acres of citrus. So it's about half uh, the number of uh, acres of citrus that's being able to be grown there. But that's not the full story. Because remember, HLB is a chronic wasting disease. And lots of the time, you can still have an acre of citrus that is technically still in production, but is doing terribly. So a better metric of this to realize just how damaging HLB is, is looking at production in terms of boxes of citrus. So basically how much fruit is being produced. When we're looking at boxes of citrus, the x-axis is the same. The y-axis now is millions of boxes of citrus. One box is approximately 90 pounds of oranges. So this is a lot of fruit they're producing. In 2004, just before the disease was found, there was 292 million boxes being produced a year. The disease is found in 2005, and it drops off even more precipitously until all the way in 2022, we're at 45.1 million boxes. It's an 85% reduction, about one-sixth of what production used to be, almost due entirely to the fact that this insect and disease combination is present. All that to say is that ACP and HLB have devastated citrus in Florida, and unless carefully monitored and controlled, they could potentially do the same in California, which is definitely not something we want. Uh, having worked in uh, citrus in Florida, it's a pretty sad uh, state of being. So what's happening with ACP and HLB in California? Because both of them are present in the state and especially are present here in Southern California. ACP was found, the insect was found in 2008 and is now decently widespread. HLB was found four years later in 2012 and has not become as widespread, thankfully. This map is a little bit old, but the areas in yellow at the bottom, so Southern California are areas where Asian citrus psyllid is considered established. The areas in green going up through the Central Valley are areas where it's been detected, but is still being eradicated whenever it's found, so it's not considered established. The damage to the citrus industry and to just people's sort of backyard citrus has overall remained pretty low, and that's because we have learned lessons from Florida. People are doing area-wide treatments, they're instituting quarantines, and if trees are found with the disease, they are removed immediately. So it's a very aggressive program. People are complying with this because they have seen what happens to Florida and it's definitely not pretty. Prevention and vigilance are absolutely key here. And so far it seems to be working pretty well, but we do have HLB present in Southern California. And here's some maps of what it looks like. So the areas in blue are quarantine zones where you cannot move citrus from inside the quarantine zone to outside of it because those are areas where HLB has been found. And then all the kind of greenish dots are areas where HLB directly has been found. And you can really see that Orange County, that's where all of it is mostly. So Orange County has a hot spot. Uh, this is all essentially residential citrus. It's not really found in commercial groves, which is very fortunate from this, you know, production ag side of things. But it does mean that lots of people in Orange Well, it showed up on my computer, but not here. There we go. There's some small pockets down here in San Diego County, um, areas around Oceanside, and then just a little bit south of Escondido and Rancho Bernardo. Um, and most of the time, as I said, uh, HLB is confined to residential areas. It's only like in a couple of instances has been found close to commercial production. Here is a uh, table which has a lot of information, basically breaking it down by different county, how many detections there are. Essentially, what you should see from this is that Orange County, the second one down, definitely has the most. And here in San Diego County, we're not doing too bad. There's been a couple of trees that have been found, a couple of sites where HLB is present, but it's not too bad here so far. But again, vigilance and keeping on top of things is very, very important. What should you do to try to manage ACP and to keep all this in check? First off, if you have HLB, do not try to manage it on your own. 
If you if your tree has HLB, report it to the California Department of Food and Agriculture. We do not want it spreading, um, even though that's going to mean, yes, your tree will be removed. That's definitely preferable than having it spread to a whole bunch of other things. If you think your tree might have HLB, it's best to get it tested, get a PCR test in order to confirm this, and also reach out to CDFA. They'll hook you up with some more resources for what to do in that situation. So if you think it has HLB, has many of those symptoms, it's definitely worth getting the tree tested. Overall, monitor for Asian citrus psyllid populations. Uh, when your tree has new flush, because again, that's when the insects will target it. When it has new flush, that's where they feed. That's where they reproduce. What you can do to actually keep psyllid numbers low is planting flowers like sweet alyssum, which will attract things like serpent flies, pictured up here. This is really easily integrated into groves if you happen to have it, or you can plant it pretty easily around trees, have it basically on the same irrigation system that you have the tree on. A listen like this provides nectar for the serpent fly adults, and then the larvae of the serpent flies will feed on the psyllid nymphs. So you're bringing in these beneficial predators, which in turn can reduce psyllid numbers. This works pretty well. Um, in some cases where they measured it out in groves, they had an over 10% reduction in Asian citrus psyllid numbers from just the serpent flies. But additionally, planting flowers like sweet alyssum also attracts other natural enemies, such as Tamarixia radiata, which is a parasitoid pictured on the bottom, which is actually pretty effective at reducing Asian citrus psyllid numbers. Only in the kind of extreme situations where you have a whole bunch of Asian citrus psyllid should you start turning to things like insecticides, because most of the time, again, if the disease isn't present, this isn't really something you need to be worrying about too much. So for the most part, I would work on biological control and bringing in those beneficial organisms to keep uh, ACP in check. That's a lot of information so far. So um, we'll take some time if anyone has any questions so far on South American palm weevil or Asian citrus psyllid and Huang Long Bay. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the question is about the hosts of South American palm weevil. Um, they are primarily in Canary Island date palms right now, but they do attack king and queen palms. Um, so that is something that they will be found in and can be problematic. But again, sort of just like by our location, there's more Canary Island date palms for the most part. That's what they tend to be on, but they will go after those palms as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is basically, where? what do you do if you want to get your tree tested? Uh, contact the county um, or contact CDFA and they'll provide you resources for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's something I've been asked about before. Um, Presumably, yes, yarrow would work. Yarrow tends to attract um, serpent flies in the same way that sweet alyssum does. So the question was basically, could you be planting something like yarrow instead of sweet alyssum? Um, I cannot say for certain because studies have been done with sweet alyssum and as far as I know, not with yarrow, but generally speaking, yes, plants like yarrow will attract serpent flies and probably would have a very similar effect. Um, the study was mostly done in like sort of commercial groves where sweet alyssum is really easy for people to grow. But yes, planting a variety of different flowers, things like yarrow, uh, will also attract the serpent flies. And just generally having a diversity of flowers is a good way to have more natural enemies like the serpent fly present. Yes. Yeah, so the PCR tests contact people at the state or at the county level, um, and they should be able to provide you with some more resources for that. Because if you do have some tree that looks symptomatic, they're probably going to be interested and will provide some resources for it. Um, you can do it on your own. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the best route for that is, but I would suggest, yeah, count, contact the county or the state for getting a test for HLB. Yes. Yes, so the question is asking if there's a place online where you can get more information about these or see more photos or things like that. At the end of the presentation, I'll have QR codes to um, additional resources for basically all of these. Uh, but generally speaking, the UC IPM site is one of the best places to get more information on these. All right, let's move on. And if we have any more questions, um, we can certainly ask them at the end.
So we're moving on now to black big fly. This is one that's become definitely more of an issue uh, recently, and I'm hearing more and more about this, which is unfortunate because there's not a lot of good information about it. Um, so black fig fly, Silva adipata, was first detected in California in 2021, so pretty recently. There's a picture of it um, laying eggs in the fig on the right-hand side, and then you can see a more close-up of the adult fly itself, kind of a uniform dark black color with these bright red eyes. Mostly a nondescript fly for the most part, but its damage is certainly not. It's originally from the Mediterranean, but it came here and is now a very serious pest of figs. It's present in San Diego County and is present through a lot of Southern California at this point. I've heard a number of different people saying they have suspected infestations of this. Has anyone here dealt with black fig fly at all? Unfortunately. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, it is certainly a problem. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have any good answers for you uh, for this. Um, but a little bit more about our biology. Adult females lay their eggs inside of unripe fruit. They have an ovipositor, which they use to dig into the fruit itself, lay an egg inside, as you can see pictured over on the right-hand side. Larvae will then start to consume parts of the fruit from the inside, and they don't do a ton of damage usually on their own, but what happens is that this causes premature fruit drop. So your unripe fruit will drop off a tree, you never get to harvest anything, um, and because of that, it's a very serious problem. Um, the larvae, once they've fed enough, will then exit the fruit, leaving this kind of little pinhole, which you can see in the picture over here. They then pupate in the ground and emerge as adults later on. The adults will also feed on parts of the fig, going mostly after kind of latex sap that it can produce. And we can get about four to six generations per year if the weather is favorable um, beginning in the spring. So these can be a pretty serious pests, and it's not just kind of a one-off. They'll continue um, to come back at multiple different points in time. So what do we do about them? As I've said before, there are not very many good options currently and prevention is key. So trying to prevent it from becoming a problem as opposed to treating it is definitely the way to go. You can monitor populations using McPhail traps like the one pictured up here, they're commercially available. And you wanna be using Truly Yeast, which is a bait that you can buy again commercially available, uh, place that inside the trap with some water that will attract uh, flies such as the black big fly in. And you can use this both to monitor for populations to see if they're present and also as a mass trapping method to get a whole bunch of them all at once. Also, you should be looking for exit holes on your fruits. So if you start to have fruits dropping off the tree early, pick them up, look and see if you have those exit holes, and then also cut them open. Um, see if you have these kind of rotted out gallery sections from the larvae, or sometimes they'll even be larvae or pupae still inside of the figs. So check for all of that if you suspect that you have black fig fly attacking your fig trees. How do you protect the trees? Uh, bag young fruits really, really early on. Bag them individually. Um, that'll exclude the fly from ever getting to them. It takes a lot of effort. It's a lot of work, but that would be a good way to actually be protecting your figs. If you do have any fallen fruit, especially any that seems to have those signs of infestation, get rid of them. Make sure you're practicing good sanitation for any fruit like that. And you also can put things like plastic mulch under your trees, which prevents covers the ground and it'll prevent them from pupating inside the soil. So it'll disrupt the life cycle of the flies. Um, and it'll also trap any that are uh, in the soil and that are trying to emerge from underneath the plastic mulch. So that's pretty much <laughs> the options for management at this point. It's also been recommended to try insecticidal baits like GF120 Naturalite. That is a possibility. Um, it does work against some other kind of um, fruit flies and things like that. It may work uh, for black fig fly, although as far as I'm aware, there's no good data supporting that, but it is something to potentially try. Um, research is ongoing on this. More options are hopefully coming soon. Again, there'll be a resource at the end of the presentation that has uh, some of the authors who I've uh, communicated with who've done some work on this. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of good information on black fig fly management so far. With that, we're going on to the last major pest that we're going to be talking about, which is thrips writ large. And more specifically, we'll talk a little bit more about Western flower thrips. So when it comes to thrip biology, you can see the life cycle pictured up top. Thrips are elongate and very, very small insects, oftentimes kind of a pale or yellowish color, although in some instances, they also can be a little bit darker. Adults have these feathery wings in most cases, as you can see pictured up here. And both of these pictures, the life cycle and the one below are Western flower thrips. For their life cycle, adults will lay eggs usually on or inside of plants. They will then hatch into larvae, which will feed and go through two larval stages. Um, these tiny little yellow insects running around the plants, feeding on the insides 
Um, and then they will usually drop down to the soil and go through two pupal stages where they're not feeding. Um, so they'll pupate for the most part in the ground, but occasionally so that inside of the crevices on the plant. And then they emerge as adults where they will then feed, fly around, um, relocate, and also reproduce. So that's generally speaking how thrips work. And there's a whole lot of different species that you might run into here in California. And starting with the biggest picture and then moving clockwise, we have the Western flower thrips, um, which has usually a slightly darker abdomen, but for the most part is sort of an elongate yellowish thrips. We have the greenhouse thrips uh, next in line, which are much darker, but they're larger, kind of a yellowish color as well. Both the bean thrips and echino thrips are dark with sort of whitish stretches on their wings. Gynaecothrips, which will attack things like weeping fig and form these kind of big galls, which have then hide inside. These are much larger thrips than the other ones that you might see. And then we have onion thrips, which look very similar to Western flower thrips. There's a whole lot of different variety, but these are some of the main species that you might run into. And it varies highly by crop. But again, as I said, Western flower thrips is usually one of the most common that you might see. They're really tiny, so you probably won't be seeing the thrips before you see their damage. So you want to be keeping an eye out for the different symptoms and damage that they can cause. On your foliage, you can get these kind of stippled or silvered areas like the one pictured back here. You can also get kind of dead patches where it's a bit more of extreme damage where you start to see these uh, little necrotic areas on the leaf. On flowers, you will also get similar symptoms where you get this sort of silvering on the edges of the petals and things like that. And many thrips do like to hide in flowers. And then also if there's pretty heavy feeding, you can get distorted growth of the new growing sections of plants. For the most part though, this is all kind of minor cosmetic damage and they're not gonna be killing most of your plants from thrips feeding like this. However, thrips can vector different diseases that can be much more problematic. Different TOSPO viruses like tomato spotted wilt virus and impatient necrotic spot virus. Um, these will target solanaceous crops, cucurbits, and a lot of different ornamentals. And they're spread by numerous species, but again, Western flowers, which is kind of the primary culprit. So for tomato spotted wilt virus, this is an example of some of the damage that's caused, these kind of larger necrotic spots that are appearing all over the plants. And again, this appears on primarily on solanaceous crops. And then INSV, impatient necrotic spot virus, can appear on all different kinds of ornamentals with these large kind of lesions that appear. So in this way, thrips can be pretty damaging to a number of different species, but for the most part, they're usually kind of cosmetic things. Um, and you can deal with them only if the populations really start to explode or if you start to see signs of these different diseases. What do you do for management? In general, there's a whole bunch of different things. This is previously a slide I've used uh, talking with growers about how to manage them. So first and foremost, if you do have thrips and they're a problem for you, you want to be monitoring consistently, know what your thrips are, have them identify at least once. You can bring them to people like us at Cooperative Extension. Um, make sure you're monitoring for them, deploy sticky cards, and you can check and see how often thrips are appearing on those. Check for signs of damage on your plants. And you can also do tap samples, which is where you go out, hold a piece of white paper underneath a piece of uh, plant or flowers, and then tap it and see if the thrips fall out on the paper and start running around. That's also a really good way to know if they are present. For prevention and things like that, you want to be putting in screening if it's relevant. If it's outdoor setting, you can put down reflective mulch, which actually makes it much harder for thrips and other insects like Asian citrusilid to find the plant. And practicing good sanitation techniques is really important. Get rid of that damaged and infested material. If you have a plant that has a ton of thrips, get rid of it, don't try to save it, um, and make sure they don't spread elsewhere. You can also do things like mass trapping using the sort of sticky banners you can see in the background. This can be effective, and it's also a way to be monitoring for them, but that's mostly something that people do in things like tomato production or times when um, uh, the thrips vectoring diseases is a particularly big concern. If you wanna be controlling them more directly, biocontrol is a great first option for an intervention. There's a number of different predatory mites that are commercially available you can purchase that work well against thrips. Things like Amblyseus swirskii and Cucumeris, which are pictured in the background attacking an immature thrips. They work quite well. There's a number of different pathogens like Bavaria bassiana, which also are effective against thrips. And you can buy nematodes, which can target the pupil stages inside the soil. So there's a really useful suite of different techniques that can all be used together as biocontrol that work well for controlling thrips, especially things like Western flower thrips. If you are gonna use this, you wanna be applying those early and you wanna be using multiple options at the same time. So you wanna be using the predator mites and the bovaria and the nematodes all at once. And while this does require more upfront effort than using insecticides, it can be highly effective. And in fact, is the industry standard in places like Canada um, where it works very, very effectively. Here in the US, not so much. I'm trying to change that a little bit. We'll see how well it ends up working. 
people do still treat with insecticides and it does work. However, thrips are very well known for adapting to and evolving resistance to insecticides. If you do need to treat with insecticides, make sure you're rotating through different modes of action. You're using different types of insecticides that target different parts of the thrips. And when you are doing this, you want to be applying insecticides twice, five to seven days apart, as the label allows. You basically want to be hitting the thrips very hard with the insecticides if you have to use them to make sure you kill them so they don't survive and then begin to develop resistance to the various insecticides. So that's the general recommended management for thrips overall. Does anybody have any questions so far on the black fig fly or thrips in general? Yes. So the question is, what is reflective mulch? It's basically sort of like a plasticized mulch that has a reflective sheen on it. It's something that's been used a little bit more in Florida um, where they have issues with Asian citrus and things like that. But you can buy it um, at least on a commercial scale. And I've seen some instances where you can buy it on a smaller scale. But basically it's just, it's kind of reflective like in the same way aluminum foil will be reflective. You place it on the ground and a lot of insects navigate by sight. So as they fly over it, the fact that there's something shining underneath them is really confusing to them and they can't find or locate whatever host plant is sort of surrounded by this. So it's a technique that works decently well for things again, like thrips or Asian citrus psyllid. There's a number of different caveats that once your canopy starts getting big and shading it out, it doesn't work anymore, um, but it can be an effective tool to use. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using a plastic sheet or something like that would work just as well. It's basically just, you know, make sure they can't get into the ground or anything that's underneath them is trapped and it'll work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a question about like big fly and if you could use plastic sheeting instead of uh, plastic mulch. Yes. Yes, so the question is, what do you do in terms of chili thrips? So off the top of my head, I'm not sure about specific management for them. Generally speaking, that line of reasoning is the same, especially for the insecticides. It's basically always the same where you want to be hitting them twice with the same um, mode of action rapidly, switch it, and then do it again about two weeks later while monitoring consistently for them. So generally speaking, that's the same thing you do across all different thrips. For chili thrips, I believe they're not quite as susceptible to biological control as Western flower thrips are, but I'm not positive about that. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is asking if uh, citrus tree has HLB, what do you do with it? Uh, you contact CDFA. <laughs> yeah. And then they'll have appropriate procedures for how to get rid of it because, yeah, it's not something you must want to be leaving around, essentially. Yeah. All right. So moving on then to the last section. Getting there. Almost done. Pests to look out for. So um, these three different pests are things that I think is just useful for you to be aware of moving forward. Uh, but they're not the same level of issue because they're not yet known to be found in San Diego County and or their effects are not yet fully known. And so the different pests that we have here are Thrips parvospinus on the left, Paropsis adamaria in the middle, and then we have African tulip trees on the far right, which we'll get to at last. So we just talked about Thrips. Let's go into Thrips parvospinus particular species. It's pictured in the back right here. The common name is Pepper Thrips as native to Southeast Asia. Here's an example of their life cycle. It's very similar to the other Thrips where it pupates in the ground and it takes about 13 to 14 days to go through a full life cycle. It has a very wide host range. It targets many different ornamentals. It'll also go after peppers, as the name implies, and a variety of other different food crops. And it's been spreading to new places in North America um, at a kind of alarming rate where people are starting to find it more and more and more. And because it has a particularly rapid generation time, it can very quickly become damaging where it shows up. They start to build up populations really quick and then start attacking a whole bunch of different things. So definitely keep an eye out for the strips. I believe it also can vector diseases, and because it can build up that population rapidly, you'll start to get that distorted growth um, and damage to your plants much more rapidly than with many other different thrips. When it comes to identification, here's pictures of both the female and the male. The female is on the left, the male is on the right. The females are sort of a half yellow, half dark, so the area around the torso or the thorax and head is uh, yellow, and then the area around the abdomen is much darker. The males are basically completely yellow, um, probably not going to try to identify them based off of that. Unfortunately, these are very small. All thrips are small. Thrips parvospinus is one of the smallest. So this is from the University of Florida. You can see on the far left, there's a one millimeter measurement. That's about how big 
Thrips Carbospinus is. These are very, very tiny, and they're notably a bit smaller than many of the other thrips you're likely to run into. So if you see a very small thrips that is half yellow, half dark, it may, may, definitely may, not definitely, um, might be Thrips Carbospinus. Um, you can also look for the damage that they have. The damage resembles that done by broad mites, so kind of distortion um, on the growing sections of plants and less kind of the stippled sections or dying patches. It's mostly distorted uh, new growth. They'll feed on both foliage and flowers, so you can look for them in both locations. In terms of where they've been present so far, uh, they've been in Hawaii for years, uh, but they were recently found in Florida in the year 2020. And unfortunately, when they were found in Florida, they were found in numerous different counties and also were present inside the plants and made big box stores. So areas like Home Depot, um, scientists went out, just tapped on the flowers and found that they're present in the plants that are being sold and shipped around. So this is definitely a bit of an issue because it means that while they're not officially detected in Florida at that point, they were pretty widespread in a variety of different settings. It's also recently been found in Ontario greenhouses. And anecdotally, from some of the people I've talked to, it's probably popping up in many different states across the US, although it's not officially been detected there either. So it's not known to be present in California, but it might appear or it might already be here. So it's definitely something that if you have crops or things like that that are susceptible to thrips or you are finding thrips normally, check them out, see if they're the sort of small half yellowish and uh, more strongly half dark. And if you are suspicious about it, feel free to bring me a sample. We can take a look at it and see if it happens to be thrips parvus finest because it's definitely not something we want spreading around California. So keep an eye out for that thrips species. All right, we're moving on now to a different pest Paropsis adamaria, which is the dotted paraspine leaf beetle. It's originally native to Australia, but it was found in LA County less last year in 2022. Um, and its hosts are eucalyptus and corymbia, and it attacks numerous different species um, for both of those different genera. Uh, this is a picture that I was sent from an arborist. Uh, the tree on the right hand side has been fed on by the leaf beetle. And so there's some pretty significant defoliation on that side. Here's a picture of the adults, actually a pretty beetle, um, yellowish, rounded, got a bunch of little dots on it. The larvae also look really cool where they have this um, bright yellow coloration with black sections on it. And then the eggs are also pretty neat looking uh, where it's kind of this big spray of eggs that'll appear at the tip of leaves or on little twigs or things like that. These guys, um, will all feed on leaves, so both the adults and the larvae feed on the leaves, and then similar to many other different insects, they will then drop to the ground to pupate. So that's oftentimes where you see them is like on the ground or where the beetles are down, uh, moving on vegetation around the base of trees. But if you were up in the canopy as well, you'd be likely seeing the pests up there as well. And from what I've heard from various arborists, they appear to be a pretty serious problem in LA County currently. Um, just starting in the last couple of weeks or so, they're really starting to see them start to take off. So trees are getting suffering severe defoliation and in many cases are actually even dying, um, which is different than a lot of other sort of eucalyptus leaf beetles, which can cause some minor problems, but don't really start to harm your trees. These ones appear to be an exception to that. So uh, keep an eye out for them, especially because we basically know nothing about management for them. Um, these aren't really a problem in Australia where they're native, so not a lot of work has been done on them. Here, of course, we don't have that suite of natural enemies and parasitoids that keep them in check in their native range. So here they're starting to take off and be a bit of an issue. Um, so keep an eye out for those. If you start to see you know, significant defoliation, find some beetles on trees. Keep in mind, it might be the paraspine leaf beetle. Um, it's not here yet, as far as we know, but we certainly don't want it to be showing up here in the future either. So keep an eye out for this pest. All right. Last thing, uh, this is kind of a pet project of mine that's been of a little bit of interest. Um, how many of you have seen African tulip trees, Fethodia campanulata, or how many of you even grow them? Does anyone have them in their yards or anything like that? Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to Fethodia, first of all, they're a very common ornamental tree in Southern California, really pretty. Um, they bloom in the summer and then into the fall as well. And they have this really pretty red, yellow flowers, things like that. Some picture in the background there. Unfortunately, um, there's some research out of Brazil which shows that their nectar is toxic to native stingless bees in Brazil. And anecdotally, there's some similar results that have been found in Australia as well. This is something I heard a little bit about last year um, where one of my colleagues as it was asked a question about these, like, you know, are they a problem in Southern California? She had never heard anything about it. I had never heard anything about it. Uh, so I went down to the local park and checked some of the flowers. And this is what I found. There's some dead bees inside of them. <laughs> um, so from a brief survey, uh, both last year and then especially this year when they started blooming again, I found there's actually quite a few dead bees that I found present inside the flowers. So here's an example of one of the flowers that I found with about five dead bees 
inside of it. Uh, it does vary by time and location, uh, but one small tree that was down on Mission Bay, for example, had about 90 flowers and inside of those were 84 dead bees. So that's quite a bit, um, pretty high mortality rate it seems. All these are tiny little native bees in the genus Helictus and Lazioglossum. So these aren't like honey bees or something like that, but they are native bees um, that San Diego has quite a few of a pretty robust community of. There's also a number of different other dead insects found inside of the flowers, things like ants, some beetles, uh, and some moths as well. So um, this is some future work that I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be enlisting the help of the master gardeners in San Diego, Orange, and Los Angeles counties, trying to do a bit of a citizen science project, get an idea of how prevalent the trees are, because I know they're decently common. Um, to get an idea of just how many there are, check more of them for dead bees to see if this is something that is common across a whole bunch of different places, or if it's just a select few trees that seem to have this issue. And I think it's kind of important because they are really everywhere. This is a picture up top of a tulip tree in the San Diego Zoo that I saw when I was there last. And then this is a picture of a little tiny tree that was planted relatively recently in a parking lot on Mission Bay. And this is inside a parking lot with nothing really around it. This tree has maybe nine flowers total on it. Inside this tree picture, there was five dead bees. So it does seem to be a little bit of an issue from what I've seen so far. Doing this research will hopefully allow us to determine if these trees truly are an issue. Um, for now, it's all preliminary, but it does seem like African tulip trees could be bad for pollinators. And if you are someone who grows these or, you know, is thinking about planting them, I would strongly consider planting other trees currently. Um, just, uh, again, preliminary results, can't say anything for certain, but it is something to be aware of. So, yes, we need more information, but African tulip trees are likely a problem for native pollinators in Southern California. So, with that, there was a whole ton of information. Here are a bunch of resources. First off, there's my email up top. Uh, if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to shoot me an email. Also, there's an evaluation survey. Um, I'd love if you could all fill it out. It has information on demographics, which is entirely optional. It also has uh, information basically about the presentation, if it was useful to you or not. If you're here in person, there are some paper copies. You can fill them out on the table up there, or you can scan the QR code. If you're at home, you can scan the QR code, and I will also put all these resources in the chat in just a second as well. So please fill out the evaluation survey if you have the time. And then here's a whole bunch of other QR codes which will be up for a little while. This is for the Palm Weevil events. If you want to learn more about that, you can scan that QR code. Here's this uh, website on Asian citrus psyllid. This is from UCIPM, so it has a lot of good information on both the disease and the psyllid. Black fig fly, not a lot of information on it, but this is a Journal of Integrated Pest Management paper. It's very easy to read, although it is a scientific paper, so that's probably the best source that we have um, for black fig fly. For thrips management, this is again the UCIPM website. And then for Thrips Parvus Finus, this is from the University of Florida, where a lot of the research is from. And then Paropsis atomaria, that um, eucalyptus beetle, here is another link to it. There's not a lot of information on that one, but just kind of an alert from LA County, um, letting you know basically all we know about that particular beetle here uh, in Southern California. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was basically, there's, there's two different colors for the African tulip, the yellow flowers and sort of the bright red or oranges. Is there any difference between them when it comes to pollinators? So that's something that I've sort of anecdotally noticed, which seems that the yellow ones don't have as much, but that's very, very speculative at this point. Uh, that's something that I kind of want to get more information of in a wider survey. But every time I've been finding a lot of bees, it's been inside the orange flowered ones and not the yellow which may or may not be indicative of anything. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to drop in questions in the chat as well. And while we're here, I will also drop all of the resources in the chat as well if you want to take a look at those. So the evaluation survey does not have an expiration. Um, sooner is better, but if people want to look at it later, that's also totally fine. Yes, so people can do it later as well. Okay, we have a question on Zoom. Any comments on quince and apple tree moss prevention and control? Um, so unfortunately, off the top of my head, this isn't something that I have worked on before. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any good information for you. Sorry about that.
Yes. Yes, so all of these um, QR codes will be present in uh, the video that's posted on the YouTube channel. And then also, if we want to, I can send out um, all the links again, so those can be present in the description as well. Yeah, if you have the description, um, I can send you all the different links and you can put them in there pretty easily so the information is present. <laughs> I guess we'll see. Um, I'm sure, yes, people watching the YouTube uh, video could potentially fill out the survey. Um, we'll see if any of them do. <laughs> um, one of the questions in the chat is about infestations affecting olive trees. Um, I presume you might be talking about olive fruit fly. Uh, that is something that I haven't had much experience with. I've talked a little bit about olive fruit fly with some of the people growing them at the flower fields. Pretty much, um, they're a significant issue. Definitely can be a bit of a problem. The best thing for those appears to be using those GF natural lights, uh, GF120 natural light baits, um, which are a pretty standard fruit fly bait. And that's the main thing that people are using. They're decently effective at attracting a variety of different fruit flies and killing them off. So if that's the pest you're talking about, that's probably one of the best things for them. I have a question about leaf curl causes on citrus. Um, so in terms of if it's a uh, pathology problem, unfortunately, I don't have very good information for you on that. Um, there's a variety of different like sort of pest feedings. Um, again, things like uh, Asian citrus psyllid or some examples of thrift, which can cause different leaf curl. But uh, as far as like, a pathology issue, unfortunately, I don't have a better answer for that. Um, we're trying to get more pathologists working in our office, but right now it's mostly just entomology with me. And then we have another question about the tiny ants that are showing up in North County in San Diego. Unfortunately, I haven't heard anything about those either. Um, if you do happen, find any of those and bring them in, I can uh, give you some more information about that. But off the top of my head, I'm not sure what they might be. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is about tiny white snails. They're probably Eba snails, um, which I'm doing a project with someone who's looking into um, basically fermenting bread dough as base for them. I've seen a couple areas last year where they were still decently prevalent, where there's like all over different trees and stuff like that. I wouldn't say they seem to be necessarily disappearing, but there seems to be some kind of fluctuations with them, where when it's wetter and cooler, that's when they're gonna be popping up a bit more. If it's been a little bit drier, they won't be as present, which means that I imagine um, they probably did okay in this past year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely possible things like lizards would be eating them and potentially reduce their numbers. I don't know off the top of my head, but broadly speaking, the more sort of intact your community is, the fewer pest problems you tend to have. Yeah. Is there anything new in ant control? Um, so broadly, no. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's very effective um, that's not registered for use is the main problem. So um, Mark Hoddle, who does a lot of work with invasive species, um, has been looking, say, into Argentine ant control and uh, citrus settings. Um, and there's a variety of different baits that they can use using very small amounts of insecticide that the ants go to. It works very well at controlling them. You can't buy it. Um, you can't legally use it. <laughs> even though it is very effective and uses very small amounts of insecticide. So on a practical level, no, there's not a lot new, but there's a lot of interesting new stuff that will probably be coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Mm-hmm. 
Would you repeat that a little bit louder? I heard effective control for mites and something else. Okay, effective control for mites on organic tomatoes. Are they spider mites? Um, are you seeing webbing and stuff like that during? Mm -hmm. um, off the top of my head, most of the things that I'd be thinking about um, for different miticides are conventional and not organic. Um, if you shoot me an email, I can take a look into it and get back to you. Um, but most of the things I'm thinking of are conventional, and yeah, you wouldn't be able to use them in an organic setting. So there are a number of different predatory mites that you can purchase, um, similar to the ones you can use against thrips. Um, there's persimilis, there's different amblyseas that you can use. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable right now giving you a specific species that you can use, but yes, there are different predatory mites that are quite effective against spider mites. Um, for example, persimilis is used in strawberry to quite good effect in a lot of different situations. So you can purchase things like that and use those as well, um, which would be a good option in lieu of, yes, of other chemistries. Yes. Mm -hmm. So lots of spider web and what is causing that. Um, I don't know. It seems to generally have been a decently good year for a whole bunch of insects. So we had a lot of rain, uh, a lot of moisture, lots of plant growth, and then pretty good temperatures. So I don't know necessarily why there would be a lot of spider webs, but I also been noticing they seem to be much more active than normal this year. So my guess would be that there's a greater diversity of insect life and stuff like that because we've gotten so much rain and hence there's a lot more spiders that are able to survive because of that. But that is all speculation. I'm not sure why exactly it would be. Any other questions? All right, thank you all very much. One more on Zoom. Avion, both syringes and bait trays work well for ants or require specific baiting. Yep. So yeah, good information to be providing as well. There are different things you can use for ants, but nothing particularly new that I've heard of. Thank you.